Greetings, one and all, and welcome to Beyond the Walls. We have been remembering, exploring, pondering, and revivifying the Easter story these past many Sundays as part of our goal of restoring the ancient Christian calendar to new relevance in our lives in 2023. This is already the sixth of seven Sundays in our Holy Week commemoration, which will culminate seven days from now on Easter Sunday. We began with Jesus teaching in the temple and Jesus disrupting unjust systems embedded in the religious context of his day. This is a call for us to challenge unjust systems, even if it sometimes means overturning tables. We continued with Jesus' initiation of the sacrament of communion at the Last Supper that was coupled with the uncomfortable prediction that one present at the table would betray him. And yet even here, we may take note that Jesus, despite his full knowledge of what is to come, did not deny Ju Judas communion. This is a difficult challenge to us when we seek to be Christ's body in the world, to exercise the same grace and generosity as Christ would share. From the Last Supper, the setting shifted to a prayer vigil in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. Here, Jesus' closest disciples fail multiple times simply to remain awake. This is a reality check. We are all of us, even the leading disciples, Peter, James, and John, we are all of us human with human frailties. The sacred story does not paint disciples as superheroes who never fail. They are not caricatures that we could never hope to live up to. Rather, through their experience as disciples, we can put our own lived experience into realistic context. The needs for mission are omnipresent. The amount that needs doing is more than we can do. Mortals experience time temporally, and there's only so much time in a day. And sometimes we are exhausted, and there are times when we fall asleep. And from this point, the story has become even darker. For it is not just Judas, who is sometimes easily dismissed as a villain, who betrays Jesus. Peter, the disciple Jesus nicknamed because his faith was solid like a rock. Peter three times denies that he knows Jesus. I sometimes find myself in conversations with non-Christian friends that are uncomfortable, and perhaps you do as well. For example, in the face of a horrible disaster, someone may make a facetious comment, well, I guess all of those children dying is part of God's plan. And that's not the most comfortable moment to stand up and say that you're a Christian or to explain that our faith is not about simple answers to human suffering and the theological problem of evil, nor is a theological defense probably called for at such a moment. But on the other hand, when we are sometimes silent in these occasions in our lives, I think we can have empathy for Peter. From the betrayal, we moved to the trials of Jesus and the question, who do we say that Jesus is? And hopefully we found that like the question of human suffering, this is a question that calls for much more from us than an easy, rote, memorized answer. The living narrative today has come to the darkest place, the torture, crucifixion, and death of Jesus. Previously in his ministry, Jesus had taught, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now from the cross, he lives out his own teaching as he prays on behalf of his executioners and, I believe, on behalf of all humankind, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. This plea, embodying the, internal principle, I'm sorry, the enduring principle of grace and generosity, provides us with our theme today. I invite you to put yourself 
once more into the sacred story for this worship service as we read and experience together the ancient texts of Scripture. And while we have now come to the darkest day, rest assured that we also live in the promise of Easter. We anticipate our commemoration of Easter Sunday just seven days in our future, but we already live in the promise that Jesus Christ is risen today and every day in God's eternal now. As we begin, we go live now uh, to Galesville, Illinois. I'm sorry, Galesburg, Illinois, where Jared Poplett is here to read our call to worship. Jared, welcome to Beyond the Walls. Thank you, John. It's truly a blessing to be part of this service today and to worship with all of the people in Beyond the Walls. Our call to worship is the beginning of Luke's account of the crucifixion found in chapter 23, verse 26 through 27 and 32 through 34 a. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Syrian, who is coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Amen.
everyone who sings with the choir. This is our new hymn, and it was magnificent. Uh, normally, we have the credits where we have everyone's name, and unfortunately, we are missing that slide. And it's kind of, there was a lot of people this week, which is really wonderful. And I do want to point out that uh, we had a new member, Dave Wiley, who is singing for the very first time with the choir. So that, once again, thank you for your ministry. And we go now live to Ludington, Michigan, where Karen Smith is here to offer this day's invocation. Karen, we are so happy to have you with us on Beyond the Walls. Thank you, John. I am very happy to be here. And hello, everybody everywhere. Will you please pray with me? Mother, Father, Creator, Friend, thank you for loving us as we are. No conditions, no strings. As a loving parent, you challenge us to become something new, something holy. Though many miles apart, today we worship together as one. Together, we are learning more about your movement, your presence throughout creation and within each receptive heart. Thank you. As we are singing, praying, listening, and finally understanding, inspire us, lead us. Give us the courage to share your divine love beyond these electronic walls. As we go out into the world, waving our palm fronds and singing Hosanna, help us to remember that Hosanna means please save us. Give us the courage to share healing and hope, hope that flows freely from the living spirit of the resurrected Christ with a broken world, a world that cries out every day, Hosanna, save us, amen. Ludington, we head to Mount Pleasant, Michigan, where Noel Gafka is here to teach today's peace lesson. Noel, we're so happy to have you back with us again on Beyond the Walls. Hello, my friend, and hello to everyone, everywhere, wherever you may be. It's good to be here. In my early years of adulthood, I spent 10 years working in law enforcement and it taught me about many aspects of life, but mostly it taught me about the ways of peacemaking. It's been several years since I left the field, but I still reflect on the many experiences I had and search for whatever life lesson I was meant to learn. Now, in 2011, I was working a night shift and spent much of the night with a gentleman who was in the hospital due to his high blood alcohol level. Now, as a side effect, the alcohol in his system caused him to respond violently towards the medical staff, and he was arrested for assault charges. But after his blood alcohol level was safely reduced, he was transported to the local county jail to await his arraignment. But even with his blood alcohol level being at a physically safe level, it still affected his emotional and mental state. He was very angry to be in the jail and the alcohol intensified his anger. 
And when he began to beat his forehead against a window in frustration, my partners and I stepped in as peacemakers to keep him from hurting himself. And he fought violently with us and I was thrown into a cement wall. I was severely injured. And as soon as I hit the wall, I knew something was wrong with my back. I could not get up. And after he was safe, I was carried out of the jail and transferred to the hospital. It took nine months of recovery, physical therapy, and learning how to use my muscles to walk again. My spine suffered several ruptured discs, and one of my hips was dislocated. A report had to be created about the incident, and I was asked if I wanted to press charges against him for severely hurting me. Now, this would have been a high-class felony charge that would have created a long jail sentence. But I didn't have to ponder long before I had my answer. I said no. As Jesus hung upon the cross after being crucified, he called out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Those words are not easy words to emit to those who hurt us. But they are words of purpose that brings the essence of Zion into our realities. We must work to make it a reality, even in the times that we don't really want to. And we can be a people who prays for peace, but we must also be a people who are willing to say to those who literally hurt us, Father, forgive them. And also, I forgive you. That doesn't mean that we are justifying the situation or the experience, but it's a testament of our dedication to the vision of Shalom in which we create communities of reconciliation and wholeness and create opportunities for redemption. When I was released from the hospital, I asked to go back to the jail to see him. It had been several hours since the incident, and he had no memory of the experience. I shared in detail what had happened to me, and then I told him I forgave him. He cried with relief, and he cried with apology. And several months later, he wrote me a note that shared of his journey through alcohol recovery. He ended the short note with a simple thank you. And those two words were enough for me to feel healed. A few years later, he succeeded in his goal of sobriety. To live the mission of Christ is to be a people who responds in a spirit of restoration. As a people dedicated to the pursuit of peace, we actively work towards peace in the understanding that it does not happen immediately. May we be a people who generously and courageously shares the peace of Christ with others, even in the times we feel we may be the one upon the cross. Amen.
Thank you, Noel. And from Michigan, we come back to Ontario. Oh, I'm off camera now, but there you go. Now you can see, yes, that's, that's a real Oregon console behind me. We'll, you'll get to hear that once Mike is here with us. Uh, but welcome, everyone, to Beyond the Walls. And let me acknowledge the ministry that you do every Sunday when you say hi and um, when you let us know that you're there worshiping with us. So I'm going to start uh, welcoming and saying thank you for your ministry to Bill Mines, Noel Gafka, John Johnson, Wanda Mercer, Judith uh, Bellin, Julie Edwards, Roxanne Gaynard, Vanessa Godfrey, Claudia Butzma, Luan Day, Maricela McLean, Peril Lindvin, Ron Bogart, Dennis and Mary Lou Bieber Gerdes, Vanis Maitland, Sharon Ham, Barbara McIntyre, Murphy and Marilyn Thomas Matthews, and to, oh, we also have Eric and Ella and Weston uh, with Sharon. Welcome, everyone. We also have Marietta Walden and David and Jackie Mueller. And we have also Frank Mendenhall, Marilyn Rafters, Rusty Alexander with us. And that's just on Facebook. There's a tsunami of names on, on YouTube. It's like, hang on, hang on, let's allow me to do this. Jerry is in, Jerry Dale Jr. is in Casper with Casper Wyoming Congregation. Welcome. Uh, we have George and Linda and Bill and Barb and Eon and Karen and Steve and Carrie with Ian and Jerry. So welcome everyone. We have Myrna and Bob Logan. We have Mary Jean helping us on YouTube today. Johan and Ann Koslak, Lavera Wade. Carol Marie from Flesherton. Mike Karpowicz is not playing the organ because he's in Arizona uh, joining us today. And Gould, welcome. Barbara Crompton, Becky Savage, Richard, and Linda Wiley. Welcome and thank you for singing with us. Jeannie Kuhn with Lisa, Keith, Sally, S Ashley, Stetcher, Eva, Lucia, and Colton. Ooh, welcome everyone. Rebecca also with Stefan, Ben, and Cal. Welcome everyone. Well, oh yes, and everyone is saying happy birthday, John. Sorry about that. Yes, if you haven't said happy birthday to John, this is your chance. Welcome Jamie, Carson, Cantrell. Welcome David Hinkle, Aaron Hart, Carl Island, Ann Mitchell, Endless Kev in Scotland. We have Daryl Scott, Tim in San Pedro, Sarah Ritchie, Bob Scipioni. Thank you for singing with us, Bob. Jack Rudisil. Storm1968 in Belgium. Welcome, Jake C. Welcome, Mark Shannon, who helped me put this together. Thank you, Mark. Melanie Keeling, welcome. Welcome, Tammy. Welcome, Leonard Warnock. Welcome, Carmen and Joan Thompson. Esteban Lopez. Hola, Esteban. Y no me, me olvidé cuál era el nombre del, de tu hijo, Esteban. Si no me lo dices, re, me recuerdas. Bienvenidos. And gracias por cantar con nosotros. And welcome Susan and Tom Weber. Welcome Richard Foster, Gordon Hodgins, uh, Dick and Julie Foster. Oh, and hoy Rodrigo in Brazil joining us today. Welcome Brenda Barney, James Carson, Spicy Roads, Jerry Monk. Oh, who else do we have? Paramount Waters, Red Barton. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. And Max is with Red. Rex Smith. Douglas Laforme, Linwood Jackson, Noria and Kathy Morota, and Sandra Byrne. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much for that ministry. And thank you also for clicking like and sharing uh, this video uh, with your friends, with your family. This is how we draw the circle wide. This is how we invite people into this community. And as always, for that ministry, I thank you for ese ministerio. Te doy las gracias. Thank you, Leandro. Thanks to everybody uh, for all of those happy birthday wishes. From the cross, as we've heard, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So who crucified Jesus? On whose behalf is Jesus interceding for God's grace and pardon. Christians throughout time have had a number of answers, 
I'm going to argue that one of those answers is universal, humble, and meaningful. But at the other extreme, there lurks an opposite answer that has been sectarian, scapegoating, and damaging, which has led to false grievances and violence. So unfortunately, this second narrower answer to the question, who crucified Jesus, dates all the way back to the late first century AD, and it even makes its way into the Easter narratives that are crafted by the canonical evangelists. You know, Christianity, as we know, began as a Jewish movement. Jesus and all his original disciples were Jews, and their movement was a sect within Second Temple Judaism. Their sect had disagreements with rival sects, like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the Zealots, but all of these were, broadly speaking, part of the same religion. However, by the time the Gospels were created, there had been a division, or schism, and Christianity emerged from the other Jewish sects as a New World religion in its own right. And so there are many examples, for example, in the Gospel of John, where Jesus talks about the Jews as if they were a different alien group. So that division separating Christians from other Jews had taken place and was very real for the authors of this gospel. But their inclusion of that idea in the text and their uh, putting it, those words into the mouth of Jesus, that's an anachronism. So that's not something that would have happened in the historical Jesus' day. And it's an unfortunate anachronism. Likewise, where the author of the Gospel of Matthew, during Jesus' trial before Pilate, has the crowd shout in unison, His blood be on us and on our children. Uh, the author here is not reporting a historical event. And nobody's going to say that, much less a crowd, and he's shouting that in unity. It's a theological idea. Rather, the author of Matthew is reflecting on his, I'm sorry, the contemporary animosity between his own Jewish Christian community and other Jews who have rejected the idea that Jesus is the Messiah. So, I want to say here, I first became aware of the idea that some Christians blame the Jews for Christ's execution when I was growing up, when I watched the musical Fiddler on the Roof as a little kid. Back then, the VCR, the videotape recorder, was a brand new invention, and we had perhaps maybe 20 movies on tape, and we taped them all off of television. And as a family, we had a similarly tiny number of music records, LPs. I appreciate that this idea of a scarcity of media content, that's a totally alien concept for people in generations younger than mine. And as I remember on a day like today, my age gets older and older every year. <laughs> Fiddler on the Roof, though, is a musical, and it's one of the two or three where my family had both the movie on videotape and the music on a record, which means I've seen it hundreds of times and I know all the words. <laughs> anyway, the story is about a Jewish family, I'm sorry, a family in a Jewish village, Jewish family in a Jewish village, located within a larger Christian community in the Russian Empire. The constable of the village is a Christian, but he's generally a fair-minded guy, and he's friends with the main character, the father in the family, Tevya, who is Jewish. But in the course of the story, geopolitics intrude. An official from the imperial government comes to the village with new orders for the constable to begin a pogrom, to begin to persecute the Jews in the area. The official asks the constable, who is reluctant to do that, he asks, do you like these troublemakers, these Christ killers? With rhetoric, Christ killers, the constable is forced to answer, oh, of course not, in order to assure his own loyalty, in order to keep his own job and position. But then he adds to soften it, I just meant things have been very peaceful here. The official rejoins, look, I've got other villages to visit. If you don't want to follow orders, we shall get someone else who will. And then forced to change his tune, the constable quickly says, Oh, no, 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 sir. I'll take care of it, of course. He then leads Christian mobs to destroy Jewish property in the village, setting things on a course where 
all of the Jews in the village are ultimately expelled from Russia. Fiddler on the Roof was a rated G for general audience movie, uh, which I said I watched repeatedly when I was a little kid. In the years since, I have of course learned that this rhetoric, calling Jews Christ killers, has led to many more atrocities against the Jewish people than property damage and even mass expulsions. In other words, the story is much darker than they can make in a rated G movie. And we know from history that the claim is false. As I mentioned, there's some scripture support for this view, but it's anachronistic. One of the few events in the life of the historical Jesus that historians just universally agree occurred is his execution by crucifixion. And the contemporary Roman Empire routinely used crucifixion as a preferred means to publicly condemn individuals and groups that they saw as rebels or traitors. The Roman Empire executed tens of thousands of people via crucifixion including the historical Jesus. Jews, meanwhile, did not execute via crucifixion, but this does not mean we should just start calling the Romans Christ killers. The sacred story is not about us finding someone to be a scapegoat on whom we can conveniently shift blame. This now is not just a historical argument. This, I'm going to make, is a theological argument. In our opening hymn, we ask Jesus the question, who was the guilty? Who brought this upon you? And instead of answering Judas or the Romans, we sang, "'Twas I, Lord. It was I denied you. I crucified you." As satisfying as it may be to shift blame elsewhere, the purpose of the sacred story is not allowing us to find scapegoats. We are putting ourselves in the narrative to understand how it speaks to our own present-day experiences, confessing our own limitations. How are we denying Jesus? How are we crucifying Jesus? And let us not despair. For when we share in that confession, in that humility, conscience of our own limitations, we can also sing, as we did in that song, For me, kind Jesus, was your incarnation, your death of anguish, and your bitter passion for my salvation. When we answer the question universally and personally, all humanity and myself individually, then we realize that this is also our answer to the question of Jesus intercession. On whose, behalf, on whose behalf is Jesus asking for God's grace? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. It's my testimony that Jesus is praying for all of us, seeking forgiveness on my behalf and yours. This is the good news. Amen. And from Toronto, we head now live to El Dorado, Kansas, where Cecilia Hausman is here to read the sacred story uh, for our lectionary. Cecilia, we're so happy to have you with us on Beyond the Walls. Thank you, John. It's always a joy to be here. Our lect lectionary reading continues the story of the crucifixion in Luke chapter 23, verses 34 through 49. And they cast lots to divide Jesus' clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. 
But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. He replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now almost noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly, this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Amen. And from Kansas, we head west to Wyoming to the Casper Community of Christ, where Jerry Dale Jr. is here to preach today's sermon from the pulpit. Jerry, it's a blessing to have you and the congregation with us on Beyond the Walls. Thank you, John. The congregation and I are just so pleased to be able to try something new this week and come in this space. For the last several weeks, we have been on a Lenten and Easter journey. Each week, we have been listening to the story of Jesus' last days unfold. Today's service focuses on the death of Jesus by crucifixion. Many of us have heard this story over and over again. My first vivid memory of Jesus dying on the cross was, at a, was as a youth at a drama put on a, by a church near Mounds, Oklahoma. It was a one-man play, and he played all the parts and all the voices. I was impressed by his total commitment to the role. During the death on the cross scene, the actor was profusely sweating, and I could feel the suffering. I left that service in awe, in awe of the story, in awe of the actor, and in awe of the ability of performance to tap into my emotions in such a profound way. Thinking about this now, maybe this is where I caught the theater bug. When I lived in Washington, DC, I worked with the St. Mark's Players, DC's only remaining community theater. I loved working in this historic Episcopal church just behind the United States Capitol. Today, I'm specifically thinking about our production of Jesus Christ Superstar. One of the great artistic discussions of that production was, how will we depict Jesus dying? How do we make the death of Jesus relevant to people today? The great thing about art is that it can be reinterpreted over time. The director wanted to challenge the audience in a powerful way. If Jesus were alive today, how would he be executed? The image the director proposed was this. Would Jesus be executed on a gurney, arms outstretched, on a new version of the cross by lethal injection. It's a powerful image. 
so powerful that if memory serves me correctly, the idea was escalated to the Episcopal Diocese and the Bishop of Washington, D.C. for approval. Ultimately, the idea was rejected and we came back to the cross. This experience truly stuck a, struck a deep place inside my soul. It continues to cause me to pause and think. When talking about the execution of Jesus, we are talking about the execution of an innocent and how many innocents in modern times have met the same fate. In preparation for today, I read and reread the scripture passage, looking for a way to make today challenging and relevant. In our world, both during Jesus's time and today, bias rears its ugly head. There are many kinds of bias, and today I'll be focusing on two kinds of bias that I believe played a role in the death of Jesus. First, we will talk about unconscious bias. Unconscious bias is something we all have. We don't know that we have it because it's unconscious and it won't be made conscious until it confronts us face to face. In many cases, unconscious bias is known by others but not known to the self. In a previous talk, I've shared about the Johari window. Unconscious bias lives in either the known by others, unknown to self box, or unknown to others, unknown to self box of the Johari window. Here is an example of unconscious bias. For many years in professional orchestras, there were predominantly more men in orchestras than women, and researchers wanted to know why. They set up blind auditions where the players played behind a curtain. This increased the number of women slightly, but not significantly. Then the researcher heard, click, 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 high heels. They asked everyone who was auditioning to take off their shoes. To everyone's amazement, the balance of women increased. You see, the women were just as good or even better at playing as the men, but there was an unconscious bias of the people listening to the auditions to the sound of high heels. The people listening to the auditions didn't know that they had this bias until researchers uncovered it. What unconscious biases could the crowd yelling, crucify, crucify him, have had towards Jesus? What unconscious biases do you have? Another bias that played a role in the death of Jesus is confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is when we ignore new information that contradicts our existing beliefs. Or we only look for or see or interpret information that confirms our own beliefs. Sometimes confirmation bias plays out in the workplace or church. A common confirmation bias is the mindset that a person is lazy. And if you single out a lazy person, you tend to view everything they do as if they are a sloth, even if new information proves otherwise. Pilot works to contradict the information of the crowd yelling, crucify, crucify him and pre presents different information. Three different times, Pilate provides disconfirming information, offers to flog Jesus and then release him. 
the crowd is not satisfied and continues their cries to crucify, crucify him. And even though Pilate knew Jesus committed no crime, that Jesus is an innocent, Pilate sentences Jesus to death. The confirmation bias, the pressure from the crowd, impacted Pilate's decision. In our world today, we are crucifying each other on a daily basis. We crucify each other's characters through our words, social media, through religion, through church policies, through governmental laws that strip basic human rights from people. We crucify each other through our conscious and unconscious biases. The marginalized are being crucified each and every day. Immigrants, minorities, the elderly, those with different political affiliations, those who love differently. What are we doing as a denomination? Are we out fighting for justice? Are we using our privilege and power to do something about it? What are you doing? The harm is real and people are dying as a result. As Jesus said, as he was dying, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive us. Some are working to confront the bias. Today in Independence, Missouri, in the lower auditorium, Apostle Art Smith is holding a teach-in to help educate and fight against the biased and discriminatory laws before the legislator of the legislature of the state of Missouri. This event is at 12.30 p.m. Central Time if you are local and want to join in person. Harmony is providing advocacy, education, resources, and statements that condemn the over 428 anti-LGBT bills before some 40 states in the United States of America. The LGBTQIA 2S plus communities are under attack. Our most vulnerable, the transgender community, needs allies to take a stand. It takes courage to be queer in community of Christ because we are not as welcoming and affirming as we profess. The vulnerable and marginalized need allies, allies that will stand up and be counted, allies that are willing to be socially executed in order to raise up the most vulnerable and marginalized. If you are not being hit by the attacks on the vulnerable, you are not standing close enough to them as an ally. What would it have looked like for Jesus if his allies had been louder than the mob? As we enter into communion today, as we enter into this holy week, I encourage you to reflect on your biases, both conscious and unconscious. I encourage you to reflect on what you can do to stand closer to and support the vulnerable and marginalized. I encourage you to take action, stand up and be counted, write your political and church leaders and let your voice be heard. I have joined Harmony and speak out against justice in ways that matter. What will you do?
of Christ, the Lord's Supper is a sacrament, and I will also need to have the slide control, is a sacrament in which we remember the life, death, and living presence of Jesus Christ. Through partaking of the emblems, we renew the covenant we made through baptism, we reconcile and strengthen relationships, and we commit ourselves to Christ's mission in the world. Others may have different or added understandings within their faith traditions, we invite all who participate in the Lord's Supper to do so as an expression of the love and peace of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. All are welcome at Christ's table. If you're joining us live from beyond our walls and you have emblems prepared in your location, we invite you to partake alongside the disciples gathered here if you're watching the service recorded, we do ask that you wait to participate until you can be with us live. And now, in as much as you are able, I invite you to kneel facing the emblems in your location as Elder Leandro Palacios reads the blessing on the bread in the Spanish language. Dios eterno, te pedimos en el nombre de tu Hijo, Jesucristo, Que bendigas y santifiques este pan para las almas de todos los que participen de él, que lo coman en memoria del cuerpo de tu Hijo. Y te den testimonio, oh Dios, de que desean tomar sobre sí el nombre de tu Hijo y acordarse siempre de él, y guardar sus mandamientos que él les ha dado, a fin de que siempre tengan su espíritu consigo. Amén. Once again, I invite you, in as much as you're able, to kneel facing the emblems in your location as I read the blessing on the wine. Eternal God, we ask you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who receive it. That they may drink in remembrance of the blood of your Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto you, O God, that they do always remember him, that they may have his spirit to be with them. Amen.
turn through darkened city streets Unlocks the door of grief, despair, and fear And speaks a word of peace to all who hear The risen Christ who stands with wounded side Breathes out His Spirit on them to abide Whose faith still wavers, who dare not believe New grace, new strength, new purpose they receive The risen Christ who breaks with wounded Himself, despite their lingering tears, inflames their hearts, then quickly disappears. May we, Christ's body, walk and serve and stand with those oppressed in this and every land. Till all are blessed and can a blessing be restored in Christ to true humanity. As we've lived out the sacred story these months of Lent, we have sometimes been unsettled and found our expectations challenged. You know, although this is uncomfortable by definition, it is essential for learning and growth. With hope, this has prepared us to receive the good news of Easter. As we anticipate next Sunday throughout this holy week, let's go forth with the words we just sang together in hymn number 477, The Risen Christ. May we, Christ's body, walk and serve and stand with those oppressed in this and every land till all are blessed and can a blessing be restored in Christ to true humanity. Amen. <laughs> you to stay with us after the postlude as we will chat with our ministers.
All right, all right, all right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. I want to thank uh, the Center Place Ensemble. Of course, before Mike left to uh, be with his parents and other family members in Arizona, he pre-recorded that along with Carlos Vasquez on violin and Erica Nilsson on the cello. Um, wonderful to have be blessed with that ministry of music. Um, I want to start, actually, I guess, uh, by saying hi to Jerry. I think normally we wait until the end to talk to the person who gave the sermon, but you're there with the whole congregation, so I don't want to delay you at all. <laughs> and so I want to thank you, first off, for sharing that message, but also for also bringing the whole congregation together to be with us. Absolutely. I'm going to turn my camera around so everyone can say hi. Say hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. We're small today. <laughs> <laughs> We're small but mighty, and it's always wonderful to be part of a congregation who's willing to try something new and experiment. Absolutely. We so love um, when there are congregations who are essentially our partners, who um, you make use of Beyond the Walls or our music or any other things in, in worship services. And um, it's always wonderful then when we can also receive ministry back and share all of the amazing things that are going on in congregations with um you know, with the entire global community here. And so I do want to invite people, um, if your congregation watches with us and you'd like to uh, do a crossover service, you know, we could also in uh, in future uh, have uh, more people from Casper share in ministry in a service. And, and that can also be true. We've done, we've done those before, for example, with the Edmonton Community of Christ we love and uh, several other congregations. So, so we'd love to do that. Yeah, and it was really wonderful to be able to continue our own traditions here as well. So we lit the peace candle during the peace. We did the offering during the Living Church lesson. We served communion live with you all. So it was just, it was such a really, I'm getting goosebumps because it was such <laughs> a really rich blessing to be able to, to share Beyond the Walls with the congregation and our congregation with Beyond the Walls. Wow, that, I love how you did that. That sounds such a perfect way of integrating the service. How cool, Jerry. Um, maybe you just ask, or you can tell people, it does look like the congregation is learning their ABCs. Yep. We're, <laughs> we're a little slow here in Casper, but no, <laughs> we, um, our congregation is blessed to be able to support a local daycare center. Mm. So uh, every, every week, there are um, lots of kids um, using our space. Um, so always trying to find the best way. And what, as I was looking around today, all of the different bulletin boards just remind us to be better people, like be the reason someone smiles today. And it's yeah. just so nice to be able to be surrounded by um, these gentle reminders. How wonderful. And I know that I'm not sure that everybody's able to see it, but I know that you're actually also wearing your Harmony shirt and you have another sweatshirt yeah. too. <laughs> and I wonder if you we showed, saw that in the slide. And we know uh, about Harmony. So Harmony is an independent advocacy group that is works with Community of Christ uh, on behalf of um, awareness of, you know, being more welcoming or LGBTQ2 uh, SIA plus communities and so forth. And so I wonder maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, some of these activities that you've even mentioned and also the shirts. Sure. So every year um, where there's a world conference, Harmony provides silent advocacy through shirts. We've done a bright green shirt. Um, we've done a hot pink shirt. And this year we're doing these black shirts with the rainbow temple uh, just as an awareness so that people can see us, um, see who we are as the LGBTQ plus community, see who our allies are. And Harmony um, has done a big push to allow people to go out and buy these shirts. I know our social media team are pushing out that link for anyone that wants to purchase a shirt. Um, we're doing, we, you know, you can order your shirt and hopefully it gets there in time for conference. Or if you know where you're staying, maybe have them ship the shirts to you. But Harmony will be, is asking everyone to wear these shirts on the communion service that Sunday, the 23rd. Oh. Um, and then that's also the day of the Harmony Communion service at Walnut Gardens Congregation. So everyone is invited to, to attend that. Um, like I said in my sermon, if you're not getting hit by the attacks of, your, of the vulnerable, you're not standing close enough to them. So come be embraced by us as we um, worship together in, in sacred community. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. And thank you for challenging us. It is never... Um, as we say, it, uh, being challenged is 
always uncomfortable. <laughs> and yet, um, um, there, this is the things that we need to be doing to uh, learn and grow and to share in, in, in true mission, especially for the most vulnerable uh, members in our community. Thanks, John. Thank you. Um, I want to also say hi to Karen. Um, Karen, we one of the things that um, because we the one thing as we knew when we when we went onto our own Beyond the Walls lectionary and decided that we were going to do Holy Week over the course of seven weeks, including uh, the Lenten period and so forth, is I, one thing I knew is we're going to be doing Good Friday on Palm Sunday, and that'll mean maybe we're not going to get to do Palm Sunday on Palm Sunday the way we normally do. And so I wanted to thank you for bringing that in, in your invocation, um, as you were talking about the Hosannas and, and, and bringing that to relevance in our lives today. You're welcome, but uh, give God the credit. I just write what I'm inspired to write. Oh, well, I thank you so much. Um, I appreciate um, that you've been able to be with us and provide ministry so often and beyond the walls. And we really feel that you're a part of this congregation, even though I know you have many, many calls to ministry so many places. <laughs> this is true, but this is one of my homes. Well, thank you for being with us and for sharing that ministry. <laughs> and I hope to see y'all at a um, conference. Well, we're going to see you. Good. I hope we see everybody. At I'm collecting I'll see you for sure. I'm collecting hugs. Yeah, I'll be wearing my tie downs and and Jerry, my tea arrived yesterday. Yes, I will be wearing it on the 23rd. Very, very good news indeed. I want to say hi to Cecilia. It's you like it's been a while since you've been on. I don't know why that would be. We want to have you on every week. Oh uh, well, <laughs> thank you. But I don't know. I think I was maybe back at the beginning of the year. I'm not sure. I don't remember okay. when the last time was either, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but I want to uh, say hi and also thank you for stepping in. We had a last minute cancellation and you were willing to uh do a reading for us, and we really appreciate it and wonderful seeing your face. Oh well, sure. Thank you for asking. And it's always a it's always a pleasure. I enjoy doing, yeah, being here. How are things going in your part of the world? Um, it's been a little windy. We we um, actually on Friday had a major fire here in El Dorado. Had to evacuate Ooh. my for my daughter teaches. They had to evacuate her elementary school. Evacuate a lot of homes. Her teaching partner lost her barn, but fortunately her home was saved. It oh. was quite the fire, and it looks like we're going to have gusts up to seventy mile per hours again this week so oh my goodness fun fun <laughs> oh well we'll have your community in our prayers i'm sorry yes. to hear all that i'm hoping you sound like uh, you're in wyoming we're getting 70 plus as well oh yeah it's it's wind well you know i lived in oklahoma forever and the song oklahoma was when the wind comes sweeping down the plains well i found out that it comes sweeping down from kansas that's where <laughs> it probably starts and now i'm there so yeah it's windy all the time <laughs> We're planning for a foot to two feet of snow starting tonight for the next yeah, few I'm glad, days. I'm glad you're having the snow, but we could definitely use the moisture. That's part of the problem. They think that the fire probably just started. It's just so dry. We're under fire warnings all the time. Yeah. I also want to say hi to Jared. Jared, it's so, we're so happy to have you with us on the service. I wonder if you might tell us um, how you uh, came to us and became uh, engaged with Beyond the Walls. I, it's really great to be part of this service. When it became apparent in 2019, right after my dad died, that uh, my attending the local church here in Galesburg was no longer going to be an option. And so I had, well, actually the first time I attended Beyond the Walls, I couldn't go to church because we got too much snow and I was snowed in. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so uh, after dad died for a while, I was contemplating where to move next. I attended Beyond the Walls and was thinking about moving my membership to Beyond the Walls. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to go to World Conference. It's going to be here in three weeks. And I couldn't figure out how I could be a delegate when I live in Illinois and Beyond the Walls is in Canada. Well, so I eventually ended up going to the congregation in Moline. Okay, very good. That's one way you can do it. <laughs> so in other words, one way, you know, you can come with us because we believe in um, dual citizenship. So we're very happy to have you have your uh, membership in Moline and still be a part of this community. So thank you so much. 
And well, thank uh, you for having me. Of course. I hope you uh, invite me to do this again. Well, I will. <laughs> we absolutely will. This has been a real blessing. And I also want to thank Noel for coming back and also um, for sharing this deeply um, personal story um, that you shared with us. I And I'm, I have to say, when, when you got to the part, even as even though I'd read it, um, because I get to read the content ahead of time as a pastor or whatever, um, I was still, nevertheless, I was kind of like almost inside crying out, how can you possibly forgive this guy? <laughs> you know, because I knew where this is going, but I'm like, oh, because because it's just like in that moment, I'm just like, oh my goodness, what you uh, went through as a result of this um, decisions that he's made or that led to that place. Yeah, it, it was hard. And and I wish that I could share in, in better words uh, to say the huge difference between this person under the influence versus the person uh, not, uh, yeah. I knew, I knew who he was as, as an individual and I knew what the alcohol was doing. And I knew that in order uh, to bring any sense of, of redemption or any sense of restorative nature to the situation, it would do absolutely no good for me to say, you know what, I can't walk, but I'm gonna come back at you with this. Mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it served no purpose at all. And to be able to look at different situations and say, how can we make a difference in the world? How can we find ways to be uh, peacemakers, even in the hardest times? Uh, that was that was definitely one of those situations. And it, it took me nine months. And, and, and I will I will absolutely admit, uh, admit during that time, there were several times when I hated him. Mm -hmm. oh, those, yeah. are, those are hard words to say mm -hmm. and 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 i say that because there there was you know that sense of humanness where i went oh my goodness i can't do xyz like i used to i i literally cannot move at this time i'm so angry but then that peace came in and and it restored me as well and gave me a, a sense of of new light if you will yeah. And, and to receive the note from him was was just it was it was amazing. Well, what a blessing that your um embrace and living out that principle of grace and generosity had that result in this case. In other words, that instead of like you say a um a long prison sentence that probably would have only made the wouldn't have that the life got turned around, right? So. Mhm. Mm yes. Exactly. And, and Thanks for the opportunity to share this, because sometimes putting things into words is healing as well. And this was also, even though it's been since 2011, it, being able to write that was uh, was healing and brought a sense of intense peace as well. So thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you always for your ministry. Thank all of you for the, your ministry, the service, which Again, we're on a theme as we we are, you know, we're, the, we're in the darkest times of the story and not always comfortable. Uh, you have done such an amazing job of bringing that alive to the present life and our and and relevance to where we all are right now as a Christian community. And I hope you'll be with us all next week um, where we can celebrate the good news uh, that Christ is alive, both on Easter Sunday and in the eternal present. And so let's wave and thanks so much for all of you for being here. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.